Okay, so here we have the Northern Renaissance. We're going to start talking about a little bit about artists and what the Northern Renaissance was because that greatly influences our project that we're going to be currently working on. So Renaissance art in, the nor in Northern Europe. So we're talking about Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Amsterdam, um, anything pretty much that's not Italy. Now, Northern European art during this time should not be considered anything close to Italian art. So this is nothing like Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo. We're not talking Mona Lisa or the Statue of David. We're talking more real-life art. However, there were very, very strong Italian influences during this time. Artists painted in oil paint, which was developed in Flanders and was widely adopted in Italy after the use of temper paint became obsolete. Now there are very many differences between the two types of cultures between Italy and the Northern Europe. Now in Italy change was inspired by humanism with its emphasis on the revival of the values of classical antiquity, meaning that artists were looking at ancient Greek, ancient Roman art in order to be inspired and taking what they learned from those pieces of art and using it in their current pieces. Whereas in Northern Europe, we had the Protestant Revolution that happened. So there was a change in religious reform. There was a return to Christian values and even a revolt against the authority of the Catholic Church. Now, in Northern Europe, there were more princes and kings that were patrons of the art compared to Italy where there were the, the biggest patron was the Catholic Church and the Pope. The Pope and the Church paid the artists to make these pieces of art, whereas in Northern Europe, princes and kings did. Now, characteristics of Northern Euro Renaissance art really was influenced by a lot of late medieval art and a very much attention to detail. And that's really what I want you to focus on is this attention to detail. So you might want to write that down. Now, there's a lot of realism and naturalism in Northern Renaissance art, very much getting away from the Italian ideal of what it should be or what is perfect in pieces of art. There was much interest in landscape paintings and more emphasis on middle class and peasant life, getting away from the strictly religious pieces of art, getting away from portraits of the rich and the wealthy, as well as religious figures and more emphasis on just everyday life. There was a lot of details in their paintings. Great skill in portraiture as you will see in a few minutes. They used symbolism and certain types of what's called atmospheric perspective which is that overlapping that small and small objects mean that they're far away, large objects mean that they're closer. Things that we've already covered in class. Now we're going to look at a little bit of Flemish realism. Specifically, we're going to look at an artist called Jean van Eyck. Now Jean van Eyck was painting in the middle 1400s, so 1420 to 1450, and he did a lot of religious paintings. Now I want you to take a look at the painting on the left here. That's the crucifixion that he painted. Now if you noticed, there's a lot of detail a lot of detail. There's a lot going on in his paintings from the small buildings all the way in the back, the mountains all the way back here to even the people. And he put such detail into their clothing and he crammed all of this into one painting. He did the same thing here on the right in The Last Judgment. So here you have Earth in the middle where the souls are rising up to either go into heaven on Judgment Day or down to hell. So if 
I know it's really small and kind of hard to see, and you can always look it up on Google later, but there are so many details on the faces of the people, their clothing, even down here in what's part supposed to be hell is there's just so much detail and so much crammed into the painting and that's really what I want you to take away from this because that's what we're going to be focusing on is getting so much crammed into a piece of paper. Now in Germany there was an artist called Albrecht Dürer. Albrecht Dürer happens to be one of my favorites and I had to put him on here. So he was considered the greatest of Germany's artists at the time. He was a scholar as well as an artist. He was very much like Leonardo da Vinci. He was into mathematics. He was into science. He was into um, literature and art. He wrote books on geometry and human proportions and fortifications of buildings, architecture. He was really into him. Like I guess you could say he was one of the few that started the quote-unquote selfie revolution because he did lots of self-portraits and including this one here that he painted at the age of 26 in 1498. Now Albrecht Dürer worked in paint but he also worked in what's called a woodcut. That's when he carved into a piece of wood and he would make a print of it on a piece of paper and he was able to get such detail and such emotion in his pieces of art. Here we have his Last Supper from 1510 and he used these all these lines to create different textures and different details and it really did make his work lifelike and realistic. Now here we have done in 1498, this is a woodcut of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And again, I know this is a very blurry picture, but again, the amount of detail that he was able to get, and this is what I want you to focus on, and I'm going to keep saying it over and over again, detail, detail, detail. Now we're going to look at the Low Countries. Specifically, I want to look at an artist named Harmonius Bosch. Harmonius Bosch is an enigma in the art world. People still don't understand what his paintings were supposed to mean, but there was such detail in them. He had a very pessimistic view of human nature. He thought the worst of every human being. But he also had a very wild and lurid imagination, and that really showed in his artwork. He did fanciful monsters and apparitions and ghosts. He did not use anything that the Italian artist used. He did nothing with perspective. He did nothing with math. He did, it was just all, let me just get it on the canvas. His figures were very flat. They didn't really have a lot of three dimension to them. And he, like I said, he completely ignored perspective. He had, he didn't care that if something was supposed to be far away, that it was smaller than something that was closer to you. He just wanted to get it everything on the paper. He was considered more of a landscape painter than a portrait artist. However, if you look at the painting here on this slide, he actually has a lot of detail in here. Here we have who's supposed to be Christ carrying his cross as well as everybody around him. And he really crammed these people into the, pic into the picture. Now this is the one, this is the one painting that you guys were looking at for your artful thinking routine, looking 10 times 2, part 1. This is his Garden of Earthly Delights, painted in 1510. This is what's called a triptych. Normally artists usually paint on one canvas. A triptych is when an artist paints on three, and it's supposed to be one painting. So here we have, in the center, you have one canvas, to the left and the right, you have another. Now, this painting, if you read it from left to right, here we have what's supposed to be the Garden of Eden. You have God, Adam, Eve, all the creatures, the Tree of Wisdom, everything that's supposed to be here. In the center, this is what's supposed to be Earth. This is supposed to be what we do here on Earth. 
And there's a lot going on here, and it's really hard to see in this painting, but in this picture. But if you have a chance, I want you to go onto Google and just Google this image and really look at a lot of the details. Now, here's a little warning. Everybody is nude. They are not wearing clothing, so don't freak out. Everybody not freaking out? Okay, good. So on the left here, we have what's supposed to be hell. And this is where a lot of interesting thing comes in because there's so much going on in that little canvas that there, it, it would take a lifetime to look at everything. So here's a close-up of the center panel of the Garden of Earthly Delights. This is, like I said, this is supposed to be Earth. This is supposed to be where people are currently living. Um, and there's so much going on. You've got people riding horses in the back. You've got people the same size as birds. You've got people doing all sorts of things. Yeah, everything's going on in this picture. And there's a lot of it. And it's really interesting to look at because you have no idea what the artist was thinking because of how long ago it was. Bosch really, he never wrote down his meaning for any of his works. He just put everything on canvas and really left it up to the viewer to interpret everything. Here we have on the left side a uh, close-up of the heaven panel and on the left, the right side you have a close-up of the hell panel where you have skulls and gigantic ears with knives and all sorts of tortures going on to what he believed hell would be like as if you had if you were there here is another close up of the hell panel we've got a person in the drum with a demon beating on it you've got people inside eggs you've got people being eaten by this bird like creature these are all sorts of things that he imagined hell would be like now this is very suggestive of what he thought the torments melted, meant it out to punishment as punishment for sinners who went to hell. He used grotesque fantasy images such as hybrid monsters, half humans, half anim animals. He really wanted all of these things to inhabit his very weird, unsettling landscape. And at the time, it even, it really terrified people. Now, like I said, Modern crit critics have been unable to decipher his underlying meanings, but it's very clear that Bosch believed in a corrupt mankind. He believed that humans are not perfect. We are very corrupt. We are led by greed and evil. And when the time comes and we do land up in hell, that we should suffer very, very, very harsh consequences. Now, here we are over a thousand years later, and we're going to look at um, some contemporary art very similar in style to Bosch. Um, here we have um, by Carla Gannis, The Garden of Emoji Delights. This is a Brooklyn-based artist that transformed the creepy cast of Bosch's hellscape into cute emoji characters that inhabit our iPhones. Um, she took the actual image, she reimagined it, but she made them emojis. The pig, you know, you've got all sorts of emojis just everywhere in this painting. Um, I would definitely look at it. It's really interesting, and I love the way that she took something that's very part of our lives, the contemporary part of what's going on in our lives and how people really use emojis and bring it and brought it into the forefront of art. Here we have um, another image called The Garden of Earthly Delights um, by Luis Barba. Now, this artist took the actual painting of Bosch. He made a gigantic black and white photocopy of Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, and he landed up adding to it. Um, he added characters taking selfies with Adam and Eve. He added McDonald's logos. He added here a soccer ball. You've got the Coca-Cola logo. 
baseball, football, people interacting with the characters that Bosch had created, arguing with them, taking pictures with them. You even see it here again in the hellscape. You have people interacting with everything. And he really kind of tried to make it a little bit more contemporary and bring it more into today's artwork. Now, our project is going to deal with a lot of these details and cramming things into a piece of paper. That's why you had to create a list of 100 objects because we're going to use these objects in a drawing and it's going to look similar but not the same as Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights and it's going to look very much like the, the Northern Renaissance artists. And that is the end of our video. I hope everybody enjoyed it and took a lot of notes.